Today, um, we're looking at uh, the video art of Lisa Steele and Kim Tomczak. Uh, since uh, 1983, um, they've been collaborating together. And uh, today, we're watching a new piece that they made uh, quite recently, The uh, Afternoon Knows What the Morning Never Ex Suspected, and um, an older piece of film, a uh, video from uh, 1997 uh, called Blood Records, written and annotated. And uh, without further ado, let's uh, bring Kim and Lisa up to... Thank you. Um, the Afternoon Knows What the Morning Never Suspected is uh, a piece we were working on uh, and when we were asked to be in an exhibition at the uh, Art Gallery of Ontario um, on the uh, Canada 150. And we thought it was appropriate. We had been doing research for a couple of years on Canada's involvement in the Vietnam War. Canada never declared war and, and didn't officially send any, any soldiers. Uh, and Canada took in the um, uh, draft dodgers, of course, uh, and uh, but Canada also uh, uh, not unexpectedly made a lot of money. So we decided we would make a work about that as a, a, a way to uh, continue to pose questions uh, on the, the 150th anniversary of uh, uh, supposed anniversary of Canada's birthday. So. That's th that one. First, one. first one. And uh, that's followed by the Blood Records, written and annotated, made in 1997. And that um, is a piece that uh, kind of follows um, the tu tuberculosis crisis that was raging at the time. It's, it's, it takes place in the uh, 40s. 1940s. In the 1940, and, and, and it's, yeah, the setting is uh, outside of Regina. There was a tuberculosis sanatorium. Um, that housed a lot of uh, patients and a lot of staff, almost one to one. And um, but it's really a metaphor for. Um, I just remembered this this morning, but just the, it's, so many of our friends were had died or were dying of AIDS at this point, and tuberculosis and AIDS are very related. Um, and most people who die of AIDS die of tuberculosis. So it was really our way of trying to come to terms with. Um, people who were dying right in front of us, and pl try to place oneself in the position of a, a a very ill person over a very extended period of time. But you'll see what what I mean, without giving too much away. <laughs> and actually, and also the uh, we started that when with all uh, to try to look at the beginning of the uh, uh, Medicare. of Medicare. So we kind of, because in that era, Medicare was again being questioned by um, the conservative government uh, at the time, like, you know, do we really need this? And, you know, surely we should privatize and, you know, these things come around and around. Um, and sure. yeah, so that was another yeah. thing we looked at. Okay. All right, well, t to talk a little bit about the first piece, um, Lisa, you actually, left the U.S. in the 60s as a war resistor mm -hmm. you, with, with a, a few people, uh, mm -hmm. your partner at the time, I believe, and a few other people mm -hmm. who were uh, avoiding the draft. Um, you talked a little bit about how, you know, Canada's 150 kind of prompted you to do this, but also it was, it was a, in some ways the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War as well. Mm -hmm. But um, why, did you ever think of approaching the Vietnam War prior to that, or was it ever something that you th thought about through your work? I, d I don't think I did, and the funny part, um, I'll tell you a little anecdote about um, what happened when we were making that piece. Uh, we are working with Ivana and, and Julia. Mm -hmm. Julia uh, is a uh, uh, Vietnamese-Canadian, and she couldn't that's her real. Those are the, their real stories. Yeah. That at the at the very end, of course, and they we had gotten them to do that the first day that we started working uh, with them. We got them to tell their story on camera, and then we had them we transcribed them and had them deliver them uh, over top of them at the end. But she was talking to us because we were together a lot during the you know we'd work on weekends for probably about two or three months on that piece, and. Um, she said she could never talk to her parents about what she was learning about, um, you know, that was critical of Canada because as immigrants, they simply couldn't be critical. Right. Canada had taken them in 
And I was remembering this when I, we, we, this piece showed in Paris in March as part of, uh, part of Rencontres Paris Berlin. And I was remembering that I, in fact, had read one of the books that we ended up using for our research for mm -hmm. this piece. It's called Snow Job by Charles mm -hmm. Taylor. I had read it in 1978. Mm -hmm. And it v revealed all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I simply, as because Canada had taken me in, mm -hmm. and I was vehemently Canadian, I simply put it in the back. I couldn't, I thought, oh, interesting, okay, move on. And, and so I had had that same reaction uh, to that. So it took me a long time, I think, to, mm -hmm. and we'd gone through a lot of kind of critiques of, where Canada, uh, one of the things we say is, in in Canada we say, well, we're not as bad, <laughs> right? Like we're, not, yeah. Well, we we did that. We're not as bad. Racist, right. but not bad. Racist. Yeah. Uh, well, it's certainly the Vietnam War was the most galvanizing po political situation for people of our age group, mm -hmm. our generation, mm -hmm. um, and it's never really. We've never stopped talking about it. Mm -hmm. Like what happened? Why did it mm -hmm. happen? You know, and then the boat people happened, and, and it just really has just kept going on and on. And then, you know, the fog of war comes out, and um, the greatest proponent of the Vietnam War now totally turns, and right. it's like, oh my God, the world is upside down. And so we've never really stopped mm -hmm. thinking about it or talking about it. Why we decided to actually make something about it, I can't remember. I know, and we, as I say, but before... it wasn't the AGO. It was no, we, no, we were we, working on this for two years before, uh, just gradually accumulating a timeline and, and research and, 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 uh, and visual material. Mm -hmm. So uh, all of the, um, you know, we're, uh, our strategy for this one, for, for, for the Afternoon knows was uh, we took everything off YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, that we just, it just took it off and, and used it. Uh, because it's very readily accessible, yeah. which is different than this, the, 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 the blood records. Yeah. All of that material is from the National Film Board, and it would have been er, the beginning part, that yeah. collage, is public health films mm -hmm. that Sherry Boyle actually found at the West Park Hospital in a, a corner. Mm -hmm. uh, they, and uh, they, they look a little bit soft and fuzzy because we actually just recorded them off, the, uh, mm -hmm. off a screen yeah, yeah. Uh, because we, couldn't, we didn't have any money to transfer them. Mm -hmm. But the other, well, they, the, weren't ours. they weren't ours. Yeah, that's true. We just stole, stole them. <laughs> and uh, the uh, the other material, though, is we bought from the National Film Board and would have been in newsreels mm -hmm. that the people in Fort Sand saw, like they had movie nights two or three nights a week, and they would have seen those newsreels. So we tried to make it uh, integrated into the life of the of the girl, mm -hmm. so that those would have been her. So there's a, we always kind of have a strategy for how what material we use and what we, uh, you know, when we, because we often use archival or uh, borrowed footage. Yeah. Um, with blood, blood Records, we did talk about how um, this resonated with the AIDS crisis and, of course, with um, the endless discussions around whether Medicare is the right thing yeah. for the country or not um, that keeps coming back. But one thing that really struck me um, recently watching it again um, is the... Um, element of contested land, you know, in this case, it's um, between the English Canadian and the French Canadian uh -huh. in, in the prairies. And, and, you know, again, we're, we're talking about contested land in, in Canada with the indigenous populations yeah. and, the, and the colonial, the settlers. And so I was wondering um, if you could provide a little background on why that was brought into the picture when you were making that film, the, the, um, that's just a real, those are real stories yeah. that my mother uh, lived through. So she was in that sanatorium yeah. in, in Saskatchewan when she was a young girl of she was 13. 13, 14, for a couple of years. And um, the town that's nearest the sanatorium is Protestant, mm -hmm. and the town where she comes from is Catholic. Mm -hmm. so they, and French, yeah. And French, yeah. that's right. So the Protestant, English, French, Catholic. Right. And uh, they just naturally hated each other. And there were really, the Klan was really around and did do some damage and burnings and different things like that. So, and, your, uh, and your aunt told us the story of the men, of the English farmers coming into town and the, the French boys hiding in the garage and throwing oil on them. So that's... On that, the ropes, yeah. On so, the ropes. We did not know that the Klan had been there until your auntie Anita told us that. 
And then we went and researched, and in fact, it's true. Yeah. Saskatchewan and yeah. Alberta and yeah. Quebec. Yeah, some and Quebec. Yeah. Anti-Catholic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, a different kind of uh, organized prejudice group, you know. Yeah. But so, um, but yeah, there. It's strange to think that there was such conflict between the French and the English so far from Quebec, so far from France, but mm -hmm. it was really a big deal. Mm -hmm. And marriages, you know, crossed, you, did, you just didn't do that. Right. It's called a mixed marriage. A mixed marriage, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience? Anyone wants to? We've got a mic as well, so a dot in the front. Well, thank you for the screening. It was great to see your uh, recent work and then this work from which I, I saw when it was first premiered in a theater. It's really great to see it in a theater again. <laughs> I like seeing things in theaters. So thank you, Chris, for that. Yeah, I'm really interested in the kind of question of historical context. And of course, um, following the TRC um, commission, when we realized the degree to which tuberculosis and still is rife in uh, First Nations um, communities. I was just really curious. Like, were th was the were these sanatoriums segregated? Were there like sanatoriums just for Indigenous children and yeah. population? And then this would have been non-Indigenous. So there were things like uh, Indian hospitals. Those were quite common in Canada, um, and the Indian hospital in this case was in uh, Fort Capel. Right. Um, yeah. It's a it's a very, very complicated and so tragic um, history around tuberculosis in First Nations. It's not this. That's not the story we were telling, but it it it, it is uh, horrific. And what we don't say here is that um, if you had tuberculosis and you had an active case of tuberculosis, you had to go into the sanatorium. It wasn't a choice. And if you didn't go voluntarily you would go in handcuffs. And that certainly was the same for um, indigenous people as well. So there's a legal aspect to it and a very, I mean, this came up with AIDS around- um, Quarantine. Quarantine, where uh, you know there was discussions of opening islands up, again in America mostly, but um, and people would be quarantined onto these, into these uh, situations. This is a disease which is not bloodborne, but it's airborne. So it's so much more contagious than AIDS ever was. But the AID, but AIDS, because it had the gay stigma, um, brought this extra kind of like idea of like we should really put them all on an island, and let them die, you know, sort of thing. So, but it, it was very harsh. Like tuberculosis, um, people who carried it, and some some people were actively uh, spreaders, and other people weren't. So it, it's it's funny, and so like the necking scene with the patient and the nurse, like you can say, well, how, how is that possible? But really only some people were contagious and other people were just sick. So there was a difference. And all, yeah, that is, that was told to, to the, the fact that the student, the nurses, oh yeah, student nurses had two possible placements in, um, uh, in uh, uh, Saskatchewan at that point. One was in tuberculosis sanatorium and the other was in uh, psychiatric hospitals. Uh, so they were to do one or the other, and so they were there. There was a new crop every twelve weeks coming in of of young women, and the this particular place, Fort San, in this era was filled with uh, with young men from the service who were who had gotten TB while they were in you know fighting in Europe or something. They're invalided home. They end up here, and you know they're all young, and you know shit happens. <laughs> so. But it's but the, the the indigenous stuff was we learned all about. They think maybe ten percent of family trees were eliminated uh, in indigenous communities uh, due to the to TB. But from the nineteen thirties through the nineteen fifties, and then it's re, the resurgence of it then that happened while we were actually making this. Uh, the, the tuberculosis re, re, resurfaced as a very big killer. And this is in the mid nineties. Yes, yeah, mid nineties. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and just to, again, um, I'm not sure if it's clear, but this is just before antibiotics. Yeah. So just a couple of years before uh -huh. things really started to change. This question there. 
Um, thank you for the screening. Um, this isn't a super well formed question, but it occurs to me like with both these videos, the documentary, like documentary aspect. And I'm curious if you could speak a bit about your collaborations and, and the way you're kind of like blurring the documentary approach or genre with like video art uh, forms and approaches. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it's throwing video art into no. it. <laughs> um, yeah, we've always said we don't make documentaries um, because they're, but we do research, so I don't know. Um, well, we're trying to explore different ways of telling stories, which, which are drawing from different references, and you might um, absorb the information in different kinds of ways. Like the blood records, we really just we'd call it front loading. We just said, okay, what do they need to know? Uh, what do we need to know about tuberculosis and the context for the time? So just blam it out there. Just, you know, newsreels, uh, a relentless kind of day in the life of, and, you know, just get it over with. So then we can have Vera fly around the hospital and visit everybody. <laughs> um, so that was the, that's, that's the strategy there. So we can, we use documents, we use, but we, change it, we twist it to, to suit the, the, the form of what we're trying to tell. And we're not against documentaries, I love documentaries, but we just don't, don't we just can't do it. It's, it's, it break the rules. Yeah, right we, we break the rules right away, exactly. But I, I think, like for instance, the, uh, at the end of the blood records, when she finds his, uh, his, uh, do, do, his writing, right, and she takes it out and she's reading it, uh, that was a real, that's a real document from, the, from Robarts. And that is uh, wartime press censorship in Canada uh, during World War II, and it was unpublished. And it was this, it was a it was hand typed, and it was in a, this folder. And it was so amazing this document that we just had to we had it, we carried it around with us. You know, we check it out and then we renew it and we check it out again and we just carried it around with us until we finished the shooting because it was it was some kind of a the the realness of it. Uh, seemed important. Um, so we often use real uh, books and real things, real documents uh, to to ground the, the 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 material itself. And yeah, and in the, it's exactly the same in uh, afternoon. Uh, there we, we checked out uh, the Pentagon Papers from. It's in five volumes. We checked out one volume, the one that she's reading from, that has the stuff about the Canadian envoy uh, guy Blair Seaborn. And um, they're reading from it, but they're, it's the real book. And we displayed it at the AGO, and we had to renew it in the middle of the show, but it was okay. Um, with that piece, it also seems that you involved the two women in the research process as well. Yes. Um, to, could you talk a little bit about why and how that worked? And Yeah, this is, again, a bit of an, uh, a throwback, but... Uh, you know, in our age group, we would have study groups. We would do readings together. We would, like, get, you know, try to frickin' read Marx, right? Well, you can't read it by yourself. You have to have a, a collective to, to read it or or some sort of a group. So these were study sessions. And Freud. And Freud, yeah. right? You can't read Freud by yourself. But um, <laughs> So, yeah, so these young people were in study sessions, and they were like, okay, let's learn about the Pentagon Papers, or let's learn about this. So a little bit of a... Mm -hmm. uh, condensation there of, mm -hmm. of that idea, but that was very common um, when I was growing up. And we also, we did it as a group, the four of us, so there was nobody else involved in the production, just us and the two young women, and uh, that, so we really talked a lot, and we found certain things we found out just by, we were kind of, we were looking for something, and we found out that that thing about the Hawker Siddeley uh, executives being bombed. Like, I had no memory of that. I was in Canada then, but I didn't remember that. But, and so then we go, oh, okay. And then we researched Arenda, and then we found out this. And then, you know, we got a picture of the Arenda thing. And then, you know, it just, like, that got added at the last minute. Not the last minute, but it was certainly not, we hadn't known that. All four of us just kind of discovered that together. Like, you know, you've got your computers, and you're sort of going at it, looking at stuff. Yeah, so. it was remarkable. Yeah. I had yeah. no memory of that whatsoever. Yeah. So um, yeah, stuff like that was, the, and we tried to um, to just continue to <clears throat> talk about what it was we were reading and what it was we were finding out. The beginning collage, 
that was based on the timeline that Ivana did for us, because she about two years earlier we'd said to her, we want to do this, could you just do a timeline? So she did that, and then we started to do the the, the physical research, like to look for uh, documents that we could use, mm -hmm. and we kept it, you know, we did the post-it notes and the whole deal, and then found that stuff. What I didn't say at the beginning is that was a, that's a, it's a three-channel installation, and it was played on big flat screens at the AGO. That's why it looks like that. Um, I, I like this version, too. It's, it, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it looks, it looks good, but. but. Um, oh, I forgot what I was going to say, but. Uh... Study. Session. No. No. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, is there another question from the audience? What about the smoking in the sanatorium? Yeah. <laughs> Say they all smoked. The patient smoked. The, uh, uh, the woman. It's a composite character that mm -hmm. the blood puker plays, but she's based on uh, a woman that was in and out of the sanatorium for ten years. And, and From the she, time she was 16. Or even younger, because she younger. smoked when she was 13. That's right. That's and they put her in the adult ward, because she smoked. And that was fine. And they also, to keep them occupied, they published little um, newsletters, little, little, little uh, publications, each sanatorium. And they were all over the place. Um, well, two in Saskatchewan. And you know there were, uh, you've all read The Magic Mountain. but. Um, and they would make these little little pamphlet publications, like eight page things, mm -hmm. and there would be cigarette ads in like sweet caporal, which I don't think exists. Your doctor anymore. recommends for relaxation, yeah. and so they're all like yeah. patients are all smoking and stuff. But yeah. um, and the children, there was a lot of children, and that's that's a very realistic um, torture scene. But yeah, and they did have to be put in casts of to uh, which is to immobilize them. To immobilize. It's a lot of, um, I think the children are hard to watch. I found at this time they were a little bit hard to watch. Uh, yeah, anyway. They're all grown up now. They're grown up. And in fact, we have the mother of one of the young French uh, uh, family is here. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth, for coming. <laughs> yes. Any last questions from the audience? OK, well, um, just one plug for them. Uh, uh, they have another piece at the Toronto Biennial um, at 259 Lakeshore East. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. um, and that runs until December 1st. Um, so please do check that out. Free, it's a, free of charge. And then um, I'm, I'm wrapping up at, uh, on December 5th with the, um, uh, the films of Ivan uh, Ladislav Galeta, a um, uh, Yugoslavian filmmaker who made some really amazing structural films and then later videos. Um, and we're going to have a, um, a show that's called End Art, and that's on December 5th. So please join me then as well. So thank, okay, you, thank you, Lisa Chris. and Kim. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for coming. Yeah.